Why are you having a big party to celebrate your unborn child's assumed gender? And so if it takes a trans person lying about how much screen time they have in order for them to get life-saving medical care, I by all means support them. So I came out because of a TikTok. But I just had a really harrowing experience at work. I have this one coworker who simply refuses to use the correct pronouns for me. Hey everybody, I'm Brad Palumbo and welcome back to Damage Control, my podcast where we are reclaiming the LGBT community from the insane leftists who've taken it over. Today, we're talking about the fact that woke pseudoscience just hit a new low and that President Biden just pushed a hate crime hoax. Plus, we'll look at some clips from a recent trip that Candace Owens took to a college campus that did not go well. And, as always, we'll react to some insane LGBT TikToks. If you're new here, consider subscribing, liking, commenting, yada yada yada. And without further ado, let's dive right into it. So guys, I'm getting worried. I'm getting increasingly worried about the state of the discourse on scientific issues, basic factual issues, and just about anything else like that where it intersects with LGBT politics. Because it seems like there is this cloud or this infection that is happening to even the most esteemed or once apolitical or once neutral sources when they try to report on or discuss these topics in that all their old practices of neutrality, of fact-checking, of everything just suddenly go out the window because they're so afraid to say the wrong thing about the new topics of the day, about gender identity or sex or sexuality or things like that. And the latest example of this is Scientific American, which is a pretty well-known and pretty well-respected, at least in the past, scientific publication uh, that is now just, honestly, it's just po publishing woke nonsense that, that really has no basis in science and fails the most basic of fact-checking. They just published an article discussing the sex differences between men and women, and there are some truly astoundingly ignorant statements included in this article from this supposedly science-based and supposedly prestigious publication. In one paragraph, they say that, quote, For ethnographic and archaeological evidence, we are attempting to reconstruct social roles for which the terms woman and man are usually used. Unfortunately, both these word sets assume a binary which does not exist biologically, psychologically, or socially. Sex and gender both exist as a spectrum, but when citing the work of others, it's difficult to add that nuance. So we have a scientific publication telling us that sex, not even just gender, right? That's what they used to say back in like 2016 or whatever. Well, sex, you know, is binary and biological, but gender is a spectrum. It's about expression. Well, no, now they're saying that sex is a spectrum. This is a lie. This is not true. In 99 plus percent of cases, people's sex is either male or female. Their chromosomes are either XX or XY. There are extremely rare cases where people are intersex and have some form of sex-related genetic deformity. But that exception doesn't really change the rule. For one, it's a, a vanishingly small number of cases. It's really, sometimes they'll say like 1 or 2 or 3 percent, but those are very, very flawed figures. It is a tiny fraction of a percent that it actually qualify as intersex. And two, the mere presence of an exception doesn't change a rule. So, for example, some people are born with deformities where they are missing a limb. But that doesn't change the fact that humans, as a species, are bipedal. We have two legs. We also have two arms. The fact that in some rare cases, people don't have four limbs doesn't change the fact that humans have four limbs. Sex is, for all intents and purposes, a binary. Why they are trying to conflate this, I don't understand. Because a lot of people are willing to accept the idea that some people's gender or how they want to present themselves is different. But when you tell people 2 plus 2 equals 5, that sex isn't biological or it's not binary or it's a spectrum or all these things that people know aren't true, they're not going to buy that. They are not. 
So you're only sabotaging your own cause and your own credibility as a science-based publication or whatever. And it gets worse because this article decided to continue its pseudoscientific nonsense into the arena of athletics, making the claim that women are actually biologically, or I guess females, in, in, in this case talking about sex, are biologically superior as athletes to men in some ways. Now, I'm open to the fact that women are different and probably better at some things. I think women are more flexible. They have different body types that I'm sure there are some ways in which that lends itself to better sp in some certain sports, like maybe yoga or maybe many things that I can't think of off the top of my head. But one thing that I do know is that biologically, on average, males are faster and stronger than females. Yet Scientific American is trying to claim with a straight face that females are biologically programmed to be better than men at endurance athletics. Here's the quote. It says, female versus male athletic advantages. Females and males differ biologically in ways that translate to different athletic advantages. Females are better able to use fat for sustained energy and keep their muscles in better condition for during exercise, for instance, traits that give them an advantage in endurance activities. The article continues to say that mounting evidence from exercise science indicates that women are physiologically better suited than men to endurance efforts such as running marathons. Yeah, no, sorry, this doesn't pass the basic reality 101 check. I mean, you don't have to be a track athlete or somebody who follows running in the Olympics really closely to know that at marathons and at distance running events, men beat women. Men beat women consistently at the highest levels of these sports. I actually went ahead and looked up the world's fastest uh, marathon running times by sex. And look, all of these people involved are incredible athletes. They could kick my ass in a race any day, including all the women on this list. But when you compare similarly situated men and women uh, who are top athletes at the top of their sport, the men are much faster than the women. So for example, the fastest male marathon runner, according to runnersworld.com, is Kelvin Kiptum from Kenya. His pace per mile is 4 minutes and 36 seconds, which, holy crap, that's fast. For the women, what we have is a 5 minute and 1 second point eight mile speed uh, for completing the marathon, which still incredibly fast, but a very far distance. The, that number of seconds is a lot in, in running in terms of a mile pace. That is a very big difference because it's not true that women are biologically um, better that at endurance athletics than men. And, and we know this. I just don't understand why they have to torch their credibility like this. None of this is to take away from the perfectly fine arguments that they could make about the importance of funding women's sports equally, recognizing women's athletes equally, paying them equally. We can have all these conversations. But why do we have to deny facts or deny basic biological reality to do it? Because I'm very concerned that people are increasingly, we don't have anywhere to turn to for institutions and media organizations that we can actually trust to give us the facts and the truth and not lie to us or try to sort a narrative and twist the facts to fit into a certain ideological campaign. It's okay that humans have two sexes and that we are different. That's fine. We can still have an equal and tolerant and pluralistic society while acknowledging that reality. When you bury your head in the sand and try to gaslight the public instead, all you do is torture your own credibility as a supposedly serious scientific institution and deprive the public of having somewhere to actually go where we can just get the facts. Speaking of just getting the facts, another person who is factually challenged, shall we say, at times, is our good old president, President Biden. Now, President Biden recently put out a statement marking the 25th anniversary of someone named Matthew Shepard, a man who was killed uh, de two and a half decades ago in what was at the time believed to be a vicious anti-gay hate crime. Shepard's death inspired a wave of gay rights activism and the passage of federal hate crime laws in his name. Biden put out a statement commemorating his death, and the statement reads, 25 years ago today, Matthew Shepard lost his life to a brutal act of hate and violence that shocked our nation and the world. 
The week prior, Matthew had been viciously attacked in a horrific anti-gay hate crime and left to die simply for being himself. Matthew's tragic and senseless murder shook the conscience of the American people, and his courageous parents, Judy and Dennis Shepard, turned Matthew's memory into a movement galvanizing millions of people to combat the scourge of anti-LGBTQIA plus hate and violence in America. The president's commemorative message was echoed by many liberal-leaning media outlets, like The Guardian, which ran a headline declaring this murder an anti-gay hate crime, and LGBT media outlets like Queer Tea and the Los Angeles Blade that described this as a brutal homophobic murder or as an anti-gay hate crime. There's just one problem with all of this. It's probably not true. Shepard was murdered, and his death is, of course, a, a tragedy and a really horrible and disturbing story. But while it was originally believed to be an anti-gay hate crime, extensive evidence and reporting has come out since then that completely undercuts this narrative and really makes it seem like that was not the case. Reading from my friend Billy Binion over at Reason, where he writes, Matthew Shepard's murder was almost certainly not an anti-gay hate crime. He reports that in 2013, a gay journalist named Stephen Jimenez published a book called The Book of Matt, Hidden Truths About the Murder of Matthew Shepard, that closed gaps in the understanding and knowledge about this story. McKinney, one of the killers, and Shepard, the victim, were reportedly connected by the drug trade, with Shepard set to receive a $10,000 shipment of methamphetamine around the time he was killed. It's also relevant that McKinney, again, who's one of the killers, was allegedly not traumatized by advances from Shepard, which was part of the original narrative, as evidence has shown that the two already knew each other and had been sexually involved. In other words, Shepard's murder was almost certainly fueled by disagreements over money and drugs, rather than gay identity, something that Henderson, one of the killers, confirmed in an interview from prison with the Associated Press in 2018. The police also originally insisted that this was a robbery, and the journalist that did this book, who is an investigative reporter, is himself a gay man and interviewed over a hundred witnesses. He actually looked into this story, coming from the place where he assumed it was a hate crime, but this, the more that he dug into it, the more he realized it actually wasn't. At this point, the real story, or at least the tremendous, tremendous amount of facts undercutting the original narrative surrounding Matthew Shepard's death, is widely known, right? Like, it's not just been reported at Reason or anything like that. It is widely discussed and reported that Matthew Shepard's death was almost certainly not an anti-gay hate crime. Yet the President of the United States, whose aides surely know this, and countless media organizations nonetheless parrot this probably untrue thing while the, all the alphabet advocacy organizations do the same thing, pushing for legislation that they've passed in the past about it, talking about the scourge of LGBT violence, and using it to drive forward an agenda. I'm not just saying that. President Biden's actual White House declaration commemorating Shepard's death actually explicitly tied it to advancing Biden's current agenda. Biden wrote, Today, as threats and violence targeting the LGBTQI plus community continue to rise, our work is far from finished. No American should face hate or violence for who they are or who they love. I once again call on Congress to send the Equality Act to my desk so that we can ensure LGBTQIA plus Americans have full civil rights protections under our laws because every American is worthy of dignity acceptance, and respect. Now, I certainly agree with a lot of the sentiments expressed there or that nobody should face violence or discrimination because of who they are or who they love, but it is concerning to me to see the President of the United States using an untrue story, a factually challenged claim, to advance his personal political agenda, the legislation he wants passed. It also seems insulting to the legacy of Matthew Shepard, that his real life and what really happened to him, which was really horrible and heartbreaking to read about this young man's life and how dark and twisted it got, isn't good enough. It's not useful enough for Joe Biden and the people like him, so they sweep the real Matthew Shepard under the rug. And they just use this fake version of him and his death that they've concocted over the years, and they cling to it, despite the facts and evidence to the contrary. I have a real issue with that. 
for a bunch of different reasons. But just what is the dishonesty part of this? People should be able to trust that the president of the United States, when he says something, isn't just lying to them. And people should be able to trust mainstream media institutions that are parroting these lies, but they can't. They really increasingly can't. And when we're having debates about controversial and debatable policies like the Equality Act, which is a, a really sweeping expansion of government that does not have protections for religious liberty that are anywhere nearly ad adequate enough, when we're having this debate over this kind of really significant policy, we should be having it based on pros and cons, honest analysis, not false anecdotes. There's also an undertone to all of this that's kind of meant to scare people. Like the world is still a really scary place for LGBT people. And in some parts of the world it is. And even in some parts of America, it most certainly is. There are still hate crimes. I mean, I personally have had homeless people chase me down the street yelling slurs at me. But it's not as bad as it was two and a half decades ago. Not even close. And the entire narrative that LGBT people are under assault or in physical danger is extremely overwrought and sensationalized. And if it wasn't, why would they have to use a fake hate crime story to promote this narrative? Up next, we're going to talk about friend of the show, Candace Owens, who y'all might know I'm not a huge fan of. I've disagreed with her on, on many occasions about a variety of topics, including LGBT issues. But she recently went to a college campus. And of course, her views on LGBT issues are very controversial. And these students were very upset and we're going to talk about a couple of clips from that event where I actually, you know, got to give her some props and have to uh, scratch my head about what's going on with our college students these days. Let's take a look at this first clip. What do you have to say to the trans students on this campus who feel actively victimized by your presence here? Life's tough. Get a helmet, man. I'm too pregnant for this. Next question. As a non-binary person, what do you have to tell me about my identity? Because I know for a fact I'm not confused. Okay, next question. Great statement. That's a statement. That's a statement. Okay, you know your identity. You're not confused. Congratulations, sweetheart. Thank you very much for your statement. So for the first part there, I honestly laughed. I laughed out loud when she said, like, wear a helmet, right? Because the idea that even if you accept their view that Candace Owens is a big, mean, anti-trans person, let's accept that framing. No one made these trans students attend her talk. Nobody made them pay attention to her or watch her clips. They can literally just go about their business. And she's speaking to a campus group that wants to hear her. It doesn't affect them in any way. They, of course, have the right to not be physically harmed, to not be physically intimidated, to not be bullied on campus. But they do not, and really no one has, the right to just be comfortable emotionally and intellectually on a college campus to the point where you're never going to have people saying things you don't like in the same physical space as you in the same five square miles. That's not a right that anyone has or that anyone should have at a place of higher learning where by definition, if you want to actually learn, actually challenge yourself, expand your critical thinking capabilities, you got to be in the same general area as a wide range of ideas, not just the ones that make your fifis feel warm inside and make you feel special, but yes, the ones that undercut your most fundamental values, your sense of self that contradict the things you hold dear. You don't have a right to a safe space in the real world, so you shouldn't have a right to one on a college campus. And these ridiculous antics are just yikes. The second part of the clip is funny too, because it's like, I'm a non-binary student. Why, why do you have to tell me about my identity? Like, listen, Candace and even folks like myself, we don't think non-binary is a thing. We don't think it makes sense. We don't really understand it. So we're not really going to accept or promote it. That doesn't mean that you can't call yourself or ask your friends to call you whatever you want. You can. But why do you need Candace Owens' validation? That weird question just struck me as like screaming of this insecurity. Like, why won't you validate me? If you're strong in your sense of self and you really do believe that you exist out of the binary of male or female, and even though you, you can't really articulate what that means in any coherent or consistent way, if you really believe that, like Candace said, like, fine, like, go ahead, just believe that. What you don't have the right to do is force other people to accept that 
and to embrace it and to accommodate it in their speech and in their thoughts and in their mind. We don't have to do that. You don't have a right to demand that Candace Owens or anyone else validates your sense of self. Let's roll this uh, interesting clip of what happened next at Candace's event. I found it very perplexing to me how you choose to only focus on the things that are negative when it comes to the queer community. Um, Sorry, when it comes to what community? The queer community. Okay. I like, it's fine. It's fine. do you not realize that people like you and people like the people you're around and that, you know, continue to have this idea of us are the reason we feel that we have to be so openly proud of who we are. Your demented homophobic and, and transphobic rhetoric and rants just further prove our point that we have to fight loudly to be respected. The reason that LGBTQIA plus suicide rates are so high in this country isn't just because we're part of the community, it's because there are people like you who make us feel like we don't belong. The only LGBTQ agenda we have is Okay, is, it a, is there a question in there or a speech? Yes. You gotta ask a question, buddy. I know you, you wrote out how, this out in your notes, but ask a question. Let's how go. How do you and how do you think other people who, with your beliefs respond to the fact that your hateful and harmful rhetoric, rhetoric costs the lives of queer children every single day, on average, every 45 seconds? Okay, so this is just gonna be a pure boogeyman. You're, you're pretending that someone committed suicide because of Candace Owens. You've got no facts here. You're just going, it's your rhetoric that's causing all of this. So I had to respond to this clip for a few reasons. It started in a place where I almost got his point because I do think Candace Owens is way too negative towards the LGBT community and that's why I have critiqued her and pushed back on her different statements about gay people and about trans people at different times on this channel. But to blame her for people's suicide is insane. Candace Owens makes YouTube videos and Facebook videos and I don't say that pejoratively like that's pretty similar to what I do with a lot of my time. But she does not do anything to materially impact trans people or gay people's life out there in the world. They don't have to watch her content. They don't have to listen to her speak. They can block her on social media if they don't want her acerbic tweets to come across their timeline. She actually has me blocked. I kind of would like to see some of her tweets, but can't. But she is not responsible for anybody else's mental health. And the, if the idea is that she foments bigotry or whatever, and, and maybe, she, you know, maybe she does. Like, let's accept that. There's still impossible to draw a line between her speech and anyone taking their own life anywhere in the real world. There's a million leaps and jumps you would have to get to try to connect those two things. And that's fundamentally unfair accusation to throw at somebody extremely bad faith. And ultimately, I really care about mental health. I've struggled with depression and anxiety in the past. I'm doing much better now. But I do care about those issues for people. And I, and I will even reach out to people who, who comment things on my YouTube or my Instagram or something like that that suggest they're in a rough place because I really do have a tremendous care for people who are considering taking their own life. But your mental health is your responsibility. And the people that can help you with it and try to intervene are your friends and families. Candace Owens is not responsible for your mental health. And to try to tar people who say things you don't like with the responsibility for other people's death and self-harm is a cheap tactic meant to shut down debate and silence the people you disagree with not to honestly engage or have a constructive dialogue. Hey guys, Brad here, cutting in to remind you that I host another podcast, a weekly political podcast called the Based Politics Podcast, where me and my co-host Hannah Cox, we break down the biggest news stories and what's trending on the internet and give you our nonpartisan, honest opinions. If that would interest you and you want more Brad, check out the links in the description to make sure that you're also subscribed to and watching the Base Politics Podcast. But regardless, thanks for tuning in to Damage Control. All right, up next, we've got another misgendering meltdown because they just keep coming. They really do. I tried calling friends. Nobody's picking up, so I just am going to dump this here. It's the middle of the day. I completely understand, but I just had a really harrowing experience at work. I have this one coworker who simply refuses to use the correct pronouns for me. I've called her out every time she misgenders me, and she just is resigned to not change. And today just broke something in me. I just snapped. I ended up yelling at her after the third time she misgendered me, and within like 30 minutes, like, they, they, I use they, them pronouns. 
and she got so defensive and I just started explaining to her like I'm sick and tired of the shit like you need to at least make an attempt and she popped off got upset got defensive what are you gonna do about it and I just said I'm gonna be really hurt and sad like that's all I can do about it and the worst part is that at that point my boss who claims to be so woke and like happy and joyous and making a safe positive environment for everybody gangs up on me with her and says like this is Carson like shut up this is not the time for a political statement <laughs> And I was upset, rightfully so, but was t trying to take such a level-headed approach to it of like, this is not a political statement. My identity is not a political statement. It's just my identity. I mean, All I'm asking you to do is respect that. And it really is within our own community <laughs> that people have the most rampant transphobia. I, the coworker that refuses to use the correct pronouns for me, claims to be bisexual, and she stands up and goes, when I came out as bisexual, everybody was mad at me. It's like, then why are you mad at the trans kid? Like, what? You want to inflict that same pain onto me? Why? It's so frustrating, because then my boss spins it around as, like, I'm the one who's making a scene and is being, like, over-emotional or over-sensitive, and it's like, all I am asking is for you to make an attempt to try and respect my gender identity. And they're both just going at me like, this is not the time. We're trying our best. You should be compassionate and understanding. You should just accept it with love and move on. Like, <laughs> it's so frustrating. I literally was shaking so hard. I just got up and left. I came to the beach. I didn't know what else to do. I was so mad. But this is just so hard it's so hard to be out and be vocal about it it's so hard to stand up for yourself because either you are a doormat or you're the bitch that like is over emotional and calls everybody out for the there's a lot to unpack there first off babe we got to stop this thing where people fake cry into TikTok. Or maybe it's a little real but she's definitely playing it up she's definitely choosing to cry into the camera for this we got to stop this thing where people cry into TikTok. Call your mom. Call your therapist. Don't go live on TikTok or whatever this is and complain about your life to your whole audience because of something so minor. It is honestly insulting to all the people with real ass problems in this world facing struggles that you called someone else's word choice at your work a harrowing experience. Babe. Y'all love to talk about privilege. Well, you must have had a pretty privileged life if that's harrowing for you. I do feel for you because I do believe, like you said, this broke you, this really hurt you. I do feel for this person, though, because I do believe she says if she broke me, like this really hurt me. I do believe that at least some of that is real emotion and real hurt that this person was facing. But that is a you problem. Because that is wildly disproportionate to the circumstances that you have described here. Which means that you lack emotional resiliency. That you are emotionally fragile. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm saying that because that's something you need to work on and improve to the point where you are a functioning adult. And can handle something not going quite your way or somewhat not being perfectly wonderful and nice to you without having a breakdown. Without fleeing your job and going to the beach? And let's talk about the part where this person said, you need to make an attempt. No, babe, she doesn't. We don't. We don't have to. We have the freedom of speech. We do not have to accommodate you or use the words you want us to use. Some people might choose to, and that's their choice, but they don't have to. I also, I did laugh at the part where she said her woke boss is like, nah, fuck this. And just, it just is even the woke boss is sick of how high strung this person is. And let's go back to this because she says like, my, my identity is not a political statement. It kind of is though. Like your claim to be non-binary is asserting a ideological claim that because you don't associate with male or female, ma masculine or feminine stereotypes, that you somehow exist out of this binary. That you are some, you are trans, you are some new thing. We do not accept or agree with that ideological claim. And that is our right to disagree. P 
people are are male or they are female, or in extremely rare cases, they can be intersex. But the fact that someone doesn't conform to gender stereotypes is perfectly fine with me. I don't believe in any of that nonsense. But it doesn't make them a third thing. It doesn't make them exist outside of the binary. It just makes you a female who doesn't like dresses or makeup or isn't traditionally feminine or attracted to traditionally girly things. And that's totally fine. But it's not transgender. It's not a different sex. And we don't have to accept otherwise just because you're so insistent. And I'm not going to lie. Like, you can't just leave your job over something this minor. Um, and so I hope the best for people like this. But I keep seeing these misgendering meltdown videos. And I'm very concerned for people in, in Gen Z because either it's fake, right? And they're emotionally manipulating us for clout on the internet. Or if they're really this distraught, there's something that's gone horribly wrong where they're at the point where they are so emotionally fragile they can't function in the real world. And then I'm looking at the parents because they must have failed them. They must have really coddled that special snowflake if they can't handle going out into the world and hearing words they can't that don't make their fifis feel warm inside. I hope you don't lose your job, but you probably will if you just rage quit and left because of this incident. And I just hope that you can accept yourself and not be so reliant on the validation of others that it compromises your ability to function. Up next, I'm going to react to this weird uh, kid rapper who's like an anti-trans Christian or something that I keep seeing all over my For You page. Um, and suffice it to say, not a huge fan. But let's watch so you can uh, make up your own mind and reach your own opinion. Kobe James coming in hot. What are we talking about? What is the plot? If you are a Susie, you can't be a Scott. I know it's a doozy, can't be what you're not. Ain't getting to heaven with nail paint. It's gonna be hot where you're going, that's Hellgate. They gonna have fun with you, so gonna be jailbait. There's only two, you put more weight if I'm great. I'm homeschooled. I don't follow them. Follow them. They look like alien hollow men. Hollow men. He coming back, he gonna swallow them. I follow God and I'll never acknowledge them. the youth and you censor can't seem to get rid of me do better it's 2023 and still there is only two genders two genders i quote the facts you delete you too tender man y'all gotta do better i love the bible and it says there's only two genders i'm sorry what did i just watch some of y'all might not like my take on this but i don't care i'm gonna be real with you and give you my honest opinion and if you disagree let me know in the comments i'll hear you out but i don't like this i don't like when leftists use children i've been extensively critical of the whole greta thunberg thing uh the when they use the gun control activists when they use children to push political messages they're essentially exploiting those kids because they're too young to understand these ideas or these concepts or really be on board with an agenda or a movement and there are adults using them as props to advance a political cause. And that's what this kid's parents are doing. Just because it's a cause you agree with, maybe, doesn't mean that it's okay to do that. That's still wrong. But secondly, while I, I respect the, the views of, of religious conservatives who don't agree with transgenderism or whatever, and you're entitled to that view, this is not a kind or compassionate way to spread that message. I mean, they have this kid say tranny, which in this context is a slur. Like that's insulting and rude and hostile to this group of people where if you're a Christian, you should be reaching out to them with love, not with hate. And this video genuinely does come across as hateful. I mean, nail polish is going to have you burn in hell. It's not kind or compassionate to castigate people, to tell them they're burning in hell, to call them names, to insult them, and doing it to some cheesy rap track doesn't make it any better. It makes it exponentially more cringe, in fact. And again, I'm just against this because I hate using kids as political props, and y'all will get all foaming at the mouth over that when the left does it, but then, oh, a Christian anti-trans rapper, ha ha ha, no, it's still bad. Because who knows what this kid will believe as an adult. But that video, now that it's out on the internet, will never go away. It'll follow him for the rest of his life. But his parents 
have basically decided for him that this is going to haunt him for the rest of his life because they wanted to get attention or clout or potentially make money off using a child to advance their political views in a particularly negative and toxic way, I would add. That's not cool. That's not okay. It's bad when they do it with Greta Thunberg. It's bad when they do it with David Hogg and mass shooting survivors. And yes, it's bad when Christians do it to dunk on trans people. If you disagree with me, let me know in the comments, but that's my take on it. And I'm always gonna be honest with you guys about what I think. Up next, as always, I have to do this because you people, you, you like to watch me suffer. I don't know why. Some of you are sick. You're sadistic little people. Um, but you like to watch me suffer and lose brain cells as I watch woke TikTok. So we're going to check in on the alphabet community on TikTok. And fair warning, they're not okay. They're not doing well. Why? Why? Why are you doing this at all? Whether it's cupcakes or confetti or balloons. Why are you, why are you having a big party to celebrate your unborn child's assumed gender. Why are you doing that? Why? What is that about? What is that tied to? Why do you feel the need to like insist on this? To just like assert like girl, 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 or boy, boy, boy. Why is this so important to you? Why are you doing this? Why are you working so hard to enforce Something that's so big about a person's identity, like their, their gender, like something that's so big about the way that they're going to experience life and move through the world. And you're just like insisting on this for this unborn person without consulting them, without, uh, without knowing them. Like you haven't met this person yet. You don't even know what kind of person they're going to wind up being. And you're just like, you are pink or you are blue. Why? Why? Why are you doing that? So I'm gonna have to have my producer turn him down a little because homeboy is screaming at us, which don't love that. Don't love that, babe. And look, I will preface this by saying that some of y'all have taken the gender reveal thing way too far. I mean, I've seen news stories where people are died or killed because people are doing crazy ass stunts to, in their gender reveals. Like a cake will do, Susan. But I don't understand why woke TikTok would be that upset or that triggered about it. People are excited about having a baby. They're excited about having a little boy or a little girl. And in 99 plus percent of the cases, that, that child is not going to be trans, not going to have gender dysphoria. So yeah, are, is there a rare chance that there could be, be identified as a different gender later one day? Yes, but like cross that bridge when they come to it, which they probably won't in almost all cases. It's fine for people to be excited about having a little boy or a son or a daughter because gender is real and sex is real and these things exist and matter and are material for most people's lives. And I don't understand why woke people have to always be such killjoys and try to problematize or cancel everything that other people do that they don't like. No one's making you have a gender reveal for your kid, but if other families want to do it, as long as they're not like crashing planes and doing this crazy stuff that some of y'all are out of control, let them do it. It's harmless. The baby's not even going to remember it. So they're not going to be harmed by it like you think. Also, what do you mean without consulting them? How are they supposed to consult a newborn? Hey, I just don't understand how worked up some of these people get over the most inconsequential things. Like, calm down, Kevin. Calm down. Up next, this person says TikTok taught them to be trans. So I came out because of the TikTok. There was a sound being used oh. that was like Bo Burnham just describing things. I'd be like, oh, that is a scarecrow. Uh, it was one of those describing things and me and my girlfriend were in bed watching this TikTok laughing um, because they're all so relatable to me. And we joke about how I think these things. And then it said, it's a trans thought. So we both kind of look at each other and go click the sound and go watch a bunch more videos. And after four or five, she goes, how you doing? And I look at her and say, I'm afraid I might be trans. Uh, and she just took my hand and said, why are you afraid? And that was it. There was no reason to stay back because I knew I wouldn't be alone. Cool. And not everyone's that lucky. Yeah. Best moment of my life. Second best, meeting her. <laughs> So first, 
no hate to this person and I'm happy you found a special partner that loves you and is sticking through you with all this. I really am happy for you about that. But that's not how trans works. People who are actually trans, who have gender dysphoria, have experienced that from a very young age. They aren't sitting around as adults and one day they watch a TikTok and discover that they've been trans their whole life and didn't know it. That's not how that works. Now, that's how social contagion works. That's how things spread. And But people who don't actually have them, like when we saw on TikTok, a huge widespread of people suddenly having ticks and Tourette's because they saw so many TikToks with it. But that doesn't mean they actually have it. That's a social phenomenon. And when we're talking about something that involves making physical alterations to your body that if you end up not wanting them are, are mutilations, um, that's not good. Suffice it to say, this person is not the only person discovering a new identity on TikTok, and that should be very concerning, because in the rare cases where these things do exist and they are real, that's a conversation for you and your doctor, not for you and some comedian on TikTok to discover together. Keep your kids off these apps, man. <laughs> that, that's what I'll say. Keep your kids off these apps, because if a, if a grown adult can be persuaded by them, how do you think it's going to affect 13-year-olds who already hate their body because it's a normal phase of life? I, I This is very worrying to me that, that people are just openly admitting this. And yet some people will say it doesn't happen. It's not a social phenomenon at all. It's all just organic in their identity and their truth. We're not buying that, Susan, Kevin. We're not buying that. Up next, pronoun lessons in elementary school? I'm going to go over a lesson I do with my elementary students. This lesson is super easy to do, and it's something that you can just continue throughout the entire year when it comes to respecting other people's pronouns. So I went to amaze.org and we watch a video there on pronouns and how to respect each other's pronouns. It does a great job of talking about pronouns and really breaking down how they are not connected to gender, but more about personal preference and identity and how they can change. We then created this anchor chart together describing pronouns. And all the language on the bottom as well as in the blue, the students came up with on their own. And then prior to this, we also read some books around pronouns. Y'all, please don't blame us for this. Please don't blame everyday gay and lesbian people or even trans people at mass for this because most of all, we aren't pushing this. We aren't supporting this. Elementary school? These are weird pronoun lessons in elementary school. It's a no from me. It's a no. I wouldn't even, I would not want that taught to my child in first or second or third grade because they are too young to understand these complex concepts about gender identity, which to be honest, are not facts. Like this is not neutral education. You're presenting them with deeply ideological claims as if they are fact that most people don't agree with or believe. This is not appropriate. This is the elementary school is supposed to teach kids to read and write, not indoctrinate them into a gender cult. This, uh, oh, that's just terrible. I would not be happy if my kid was coming home with uh, Zers M pin and, and I've just gotten a pronoun lesson in first grade. It's not age appropriate. It's not an anti-LGBT thing, right? This is not hate. It's about what's age appropriate for kids. And telling first graders that they might be too spirit is not age appropriate. You're just going to confuse kids. If you do have, and 99 plus percent of the time, it's not necessary. If you do have a kid in that class who has gender dysphoria or is having gender issues or wants to have different pronouns, tackle it in a case-by-case -case situation. But in almost all the cases, it's not going to be an issue and you don't need to needlessly confuse kids or expose them to material they can't understand to do this. In the rare instances where a situation does come up, just address and deal with it and teach them all to be kind and respectful to each other and respect each other's different right to feel their own ways. It's not that hard. But what you're doing here is really going to rub a lot of people the wrong way and bring about backlash to the entire LGBT community. So I do not appreciate that Susan or Kevin or whatever this person is. Up next, this TikToker is encouraging people to lie to their doctor. Sometimes lying to doctors is okay, and sometimes it's necessary. This discussion is about oh. medical providers telling people who are seeking a gender dysphoria diagnosis or access to gender affirming care that they aren't trans based on how much time they spend on TikTok. That's what I was talking about in that video. The idea that being trans is a mass hysteria or a socially contagious mental illness that people are catching through spending time on social media. That's a load of bull- 
And if a medical provider asks you if you spend a lot of time on TikTok and you say yes, they can deny you gender affirming care. That is a trend that is starting to happen. Like I said in that video, this is something that we already saw happen with Tourette syndrome. Thousands of people could not get the medical attention that they need based on these unsubstantiated biases that medical providers have. And so if it takes a trans person lying about how much screen time they have in order for them to get life-saving medical care, I by all means support them. Doctors should be evaluating people based on their feelings and experiences, not how much time they spend looking at social media. This is so terrible because this person is literally encouraging children. I mean, who do you think the audience is? Half of the people on TikTok to lie to their doctors. No, no, that's deranged. You should be honest with your doctor because they're the medical experts and these treatments you're talking about have life altering consequences and side effects. They are not a joke. It is not like taking sugar pills. It is not like munching down candy on Halloween. We're talking about things that can affect your lifelong fertility, your lifelong sexual functioning. This is not a joke and it is something that doctors need to carefully consider if it is right for a person and if they meet a certain diagnosis or is it just a passing fad or something they are, yes, have been exposed to on TikTok because guess what? That's not always, doesn't always mean they actually have persistent gender identity issues. In fact, a lot of people, we literally just played a video a few minutes ago of somebody who said they discovered they were trans off TikTok, even though that's not how it works. If you have gender dysphoria, you will have it innately for a long time. It won't just emerge because you see some TikToks. If it does, then you don't really have gender dysphoria and you shouldn't be making life altering medical decisions. And you certainly shouldn't be lying to your medical professionals. They went to school for a very long time and they understand these things better than you and your WebMD or your TikTok search. So the idea that you're going to circumvent their judgment by lying to them to trick them into giving you the medication you want rather than the medication you need is a very bad idea and a very dangerous and slightly creepy thing to be suggesting to children on TikTok. All right, guys, I can't handle any more LGB TikToks without my brain exploding. And that's it for this episode of the Damage Control Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. If you're new here or if you're a repeat viewer, I know y'all are repeat viewers and don't subscribe. Please subscribe. Take a second out of your day. Subscribe, like, comment, yada, yada, yada. And I'll see you all in my next video. If you want to keep watching Damage Control, check out my interviews with Blair White or Buck Angel for your next video.